they bought Marvel, and now it's like Marvel's probably thinking, hmm, they're going down. Marvel would have never been as big as they were if it wasn't for Disney, I guess, because of capital and all that other stuff. But, but it was a double-edged sword. Yes. The longevity is starting to not be there, that's for sure. And I'm not just talking about the MCU. I'm just saying, like, people seem to be pretty turned off these days in general by that whole universe. Less and less people care. This is what you think about that. I'm glad that I have Daisy and Shane with me today for this discussion. It's going to be really fun. If you had the Infinity Gauntlet and you had to snap three comic book movies out of existence, Ooh. which three films would they be? We'll start off with you, Mr. Shane. Put you right in the hot seat. Deadpool 1, 2, and go ahead and do three. What? Yeah, I mean, I would be cool if I never had to hear about any of those movies ever again at this point. What is with your disdain for Deadpool? I don't understand that. I mean, well, for starters, they honey potted me. I don't know if it fits the same way when you're trying to edit what you're trying to say. Me trying to clear out what I'm trying to say. They look, I thought we were getting that Wolverine thing like at the beginning of this year. Like, I, I don't know what happened. I guess Hollywood went in Hollywood, so they had to push it back a little bit more. But I, I don't care. Forget the third movie. I'm saving my third one for once that movie comes out, and then I'll Thanos snap it again. Gauntlet's gone, and so is all of the Deadpool movies. That doesn't make any sense, Shane. That really doesn't make any sense. <laughs> You didn't like the first Deadpool. No. We'll start with that. I did not. The hype around it was all fine and dandy, but he's like Will Ferrell as like a rated R comic book character. My penis is tingling right now. Just constantly annoying, just childish, bougie, boo, blah, blah, like just constantly. And it drives me nuts. I know that everyone is like, that's the reason we love it. I don't like anything about it. So you don't like the humor? Don't really care about Ryan Reynolds either. Wow. We're starting off with a really hot take there. What do you think, Daisy? What, what would be the uh, the three comic book movies that you would snap out of existence? It's obviously going to be well, – it's funny because it's a Ryan Reynolds movie. It would be Green Lantern. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can't stick it to three. I'm just going to go like every Fantastic Four that has existed. I didn't like enjoy any of them even in their time. But Green Lantern, that and all the Fantastic Fours, especially the last Fantastic Four, it was just absolute trash. Yeah, the 2015 fan four stick was really bad. Oh, I can remember when I was in this uh, popular band in our hometown back in the day. I drugged oh. them all to go see the <laughs> sequel to Fantastic Four that came out in 05. It was 07's Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. I was all gung ho about it because at that time we did not have that many superhero films that were good. I guess the measuring stick has been elevated a whole lot since 07 because one year later we got Iron Man. But we went to go see Rise of the Silver Surfer in theaters. That movie was really bad. And the 2015 Fan 4 stick was even worse. I just heard about the Fan 4 stick like maybe three or four months ago. I didn't even realize that that was like a thing. Yeah. You're not missing out on much, man. You did yeah. yourself a favor by yeah. not seeing that one. Apparently not. I knew about the more recent one with, uh, I guess, Michael B. Jordan and some other people. Was it Michael? No, B. that Jordan? is it. That's Fan Forced. Oh, it. That's the same one. Is that old? It's 2015. It doesn't feel like it feels like it wasn't that long ago. We're old, Wait, man. We're, we're getting there. We oh my <laughs> gosh, dude! Miles Teller. He was in that movie too. Yes. yes. He was the same one. I, oh my gosh, dude! I can't even believe that. I mean, I never saw it, obviously, but I, I remember it was like a while ago. They're like, "Hey, we're gonna put this out." And they're like, actually, we might not be able to. And then they're like, okay, we're going to put it out. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of reshoots and a lot of drama on set, apparently, yeah. making that film. For me, I would start off with Catwoman because that's a movie for the longest time that I never saw. And because of this cursed comic book podcast that I have, I had to watch it about a year ago. It was so bad. And it really, it's one of those movies that's so bad that it just puts a stain on the name of comic book movies in general. Halle Berry had no business playing Storm, and then they brought her in to play Catwoman, which, interesting fact, I didn't know this until recently, but the Catwoman film was a script that they created for Michelle Pfeiffer as a spinoff of the Tim Burton Batman movies, which I'm sure wouldn't have been any better. But they gave it to Halle Berry, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years later, and it was crap. Very, very awful film. So that would be the first one for me. Second one would be Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's remained at the very bottom of my list for over 10 years now for a reason. David Hasselhoff playing Nick Fury. Already, you know you're going to get a lot of cheese. Really, really cringy, bad. Everything about that movie was awful. And the third one, the sequel to Ghost Rider. The first Ghost Rider was kind of 
pitiful and medi- mediocre, but Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance gave Nicolas Cage a bad name. It gave Ghost Rider a bad name. And at that time, it kind of gave Marvel a bad name too. That's one of the only movies I've ever actually walked out of. I can't tell you how the movie ended because I never made it to the end because I just couldn't take it. Do you think a movie like that could be why like we haven't really seen much good come from Nick Cage since then? Maybe, but recently he has had a bit of a resurgence, I will say, in Hollywood. It's like unbearable (laughs) weight of massive Yeah, the unbearable weight of massive talent. I think that's what it was called. That was a good movie. And then also there's been some other ones as of late. He was like he was like Dracula or something, wasn't he? Renfield, yes. I haven't seen it yet, but I really want to see it. I've heard good but things. But still to your point, Daisy, I mean, there was a time period there for like eight to ten years where it seems like Nick Cage, the only time you ever heard anything about him other than him doing some like really like barely a red box type movie is like, oh man, he bought like a dinosaur skull and he's uh, in debt, you know, or something like that. <laughs> like it was always these random stories about Nick Cage being in a bond or something like that. He said that he did go broke, but he's not broke anymore again. <laughs> He worked things I, I think to that point, though, it was for that movie. I wouldn't say he was in a bunch of big blockbuster movies, but he had gained that character. And for it to be able to get a sequel and all of that, it actually had something. But it seemed like right after that, it was like, you know what? He's really not that good. So yeah. the best we can do is give him a whole bunch of indie films. I know what it was. I figured it out. I just thought about it. Listen, he flew too close to the sun. Uh, National <laughs> Treasure. And he exposed some real stuff with Disney's help. And ever since then, him and Disney have both been trying to be like, we're sorry. The Masons and stuff, you never know, man. The Illuminati were after him. The Illuminati got after Nick Cage. They said, look, dude, we don't want to do this, but the next nine years is going to be applied on your life. And uh, <laughs> they gave him Ghost Rider after that. <laughs> You're going to have to suffer this. Yes. You're going to go bankrupt right after. Yes. He wasn't supposed to recover from that. I declare... Bankruptcy! So currently the Marvel's total projection, their total domestic projection is at 121 to 189 million, which for Marvel would be catastrophic. The first Captain Marvel film made over a billion dollars. And the people who are still to this day mass defenders of Brie Larson and Captain Marvel always throw that out, out at you as, okay, well, you think this movie's so bad? You think Brie Larson... Lar- performance was so awful well the movie made a billion dollars at the box office what you gonna say about that this is what i'm gonna say about that first of all she got demoted in her own sequel she's no longer the star of the show right it's a ensemble piece and now the projections are looking very very terrible for the film what i would like to ask you guys is do you think we'll start off with 500 million over or under do you think the marvels the sequel to captain marvel is going to make over or under 500 mil definitely under. under under so so both are saying both you guys are saying under i will agree with that what about 250 mil like worldwide total accumulation 250 mil do you think that it's going to make over or under that it's hard to say i really believe that if they don't break even they'll be close to losing i don't know what how much production cost has been so far they're going to be suffering to even make a flat line on or make back what it's cost the studio. You think about all of the things that they've already had to shift and move and adjust the critiques and all of that that have completely come against it. In my opinion, it's almost like the show Echo. It's like, you know, we know it's going to be bad. The best thing we can do is just try and get something back for it. In the current climate right now, we had a Black Adam that came out with, at the time, and still really, the world's one of the world's biggest stars, The Rock, and it still couldn't scrape $400 million out of the box office. That was considered a flop because I think overall, after you consider the budget and everything else, it had to at least make $500 million to break even somewhere in that ballpark. It's going to be a similar situation with the Marvels. I can promise you that they spent almost $200 million making that film. And on top of that, the marketing costs and everything else, yeah, it's going to have to make four or five hundred mil just to break even i personally i think that there's no chance to quote vince mcmahon that it's going to make 500 or more but 250 i will give it the benefit of the doubt i'll say that it'll make a little bit over 250 mil i'm thinking probably in the ballpark of 250 to 300 total worldwide accumulation for marvel and for the marvel's 
Brie Larson, that's going to be a massive flop. That's going to be considered a failure. And the same thing, you know, currently we have like three DC films in a row that were flops, starting with Black Adam. Blue Beetle was a flop as well. The Flash was a massive flop considering the money they spent on that film. It was in that $300, $400 million range. I'm thinking the same thing as you guys. I think it's going to be a flop but I won't say that it's going to make less than $250 million. That's a really low bar, especially for an MCU film. So I don't think it's going to go that low, but it's going to be close. I do find it kind of funny that you did assume that I was going to say it was going to be an absolute major flop and a catastrophe. I have a question for you. I'll give you my answer on whether or not I think it's going to make $500 million, but I want to ask you a question first. How much do you think that Disney thinks that it's going to make? I think that Disney and Marvel and Feige are in panic mode right now. Just look at what they recently did with their Daredevil show that they already had eight episodes fully shot, fully completed. I don't know if they were edited yet, but I would assume that they were. But they scrapped the whole entire thing, threw it out the window. Kevin Feige said, we're redoing this whole thing. In this current climate, I think that Marvel, Disney, and Kevin Feige are highly worried about this film coming out because they know that us as audiences are kind of over this whole agenda to push more female characters, more diversity, everything else. And uh, along with the message, don't forget about yeah. that. The message is so heavily forced these days in film and all of pop culture. So yes, I think that Marvel is very worried right now. That's kind of what I was thinking. I think that this is like at, for so long, you know, with like a, a big giant, I don't know if you'd say a tsunami. There's so many big waves that hit shore and these big, and as they're coming back, it's just getting ready to just walk through and take out a whole city. That's what this movie is. This movie is the final nail in the coffin. The la they're throwing the dirt because the marketing budget for this can't be that much either. And I think that they know that they're probably about to take one of the biggest hits that they've had to since all this stuff started. And they're like, we have to put this movie out. I honestly think it might go somewhere between 200 million and 250 million it might be more than that but i'm honestly kind of looking forward to watching the massive tidal waves smash onto the city i'm just curious to see how it plays out because i haven't seen anybody talking about this movie and it's supposed to be like some big film allegedly but i, I don't know i could just be buying into the hype and the uh, drama of it all but I just have also watched the umbrella in which is Disney and Marvel and whatever it is that they've got going on. I have watched them literally turn their guns against themselves and just start blowing their integrity to pieces. So I'm just curious, and metaphorically speaking, not like literally, obviously, but it just seems like they're do they're they're like destroying their legacy with so many different things. They bought Marvel, and now it's like Marvel's probably thinking, hmm, they're going down. Marvel would have never been as big as they were if it wasn't for Disney, I guess, because of capital and all that other stuff. But, but it was a double-edged sword. Yes. The longevity is starting to not be there, that's for sure. And I'm not just talking about the MCU. I'm just saying, like, people seem to be pretty turned off these days in general by that whole universe. Less and less people care. You're not beating any records. They're going to have to put highest-selling, all-top cast with females in it in order that for them to get some kind of, like, you know how they always try to give these quotes and stats for different movies these days and music and everything else. They're always reaching to find some new way for it to make sense. Like, I don't know that this is going to break any records and they probably really would like for it to uh, in the box office. And I don't think it's going to. The best quote that they could probably do, because I'm sure you're talking about like when they do the previews and used to have like the voiceover, the greatest movie of all time. Yeah. The best quote you could probably put across is the most unnecessary movie of all time. <laughs> yeah. Like, or the it, most but, unwanted. Oh, yeah. We have completely unwanted this film since we first heard about it. And probably even before then, like once we saw Captain Marvel, we were like, eh, we could care less about any more of the storyline. It's easier to bite the bullet, let our investors help us get through it and make the film versus breaching the contract and saying, you know what, we can't afford to lose the money. We know the film's going to fail. Breaching those contracts and then having to pay these actresses and all of that, the money that would come from breaching a contract. When they signed on, they have like five film contracts. Or in the beginning, there was a time where Marvel would actually listen or actually be in the same vein of what the fans were wanting. Correct. And now it's like, I'm really not so much worried about what y'all want. We're going to do what the contracts and all the agreements and all of those we're, things. We're going to re-educate you as an audience. We're going to check off these diversity boxes. We're going to do what we want. And if you don't like it, you are the villain. 
Yeah. And you are what's wrong with society. And you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you don't like this movie, you're a bigot. That's the message. Where does that money, where do these investors get their money? You know what I'm saying? The investors have their money. Why is it like I was going to say just a second ago when you were talking about little boxes where they have like Cisco and Ebert say, you know, blah, blah, whatever. I was thinking like the movie that the least amount of people asked for. And it's like in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, the movie that the least amount of people, why, why are they making that movie? Not this one exclusively, but there's just other things. Why are you giving people plot lines and stories that the least amount of people are asking about? And I understand to a degree, like inclusivity and stuff like that. To Which is degree. important. I won't yeah. deny. Absolutely. It's like, but in the same breath, I'm like, what is this? Like, like nobody, like, okay. Like, I don't know who is asking. I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not that social of a creature these days, but it's not that often that I'm seeing like the high school girls being like, man, I can't wait until there's, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not, that doesn't happen. They're not, they don't give a damn about that movie. I think that that's a rabbit <laughs> hole that if we really truly explore, will bring us in a whole different direction and it'll take another 20 minutes to talk about. I think that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that we don't know about that a lot of people aren't privy to. Yes, I think that they are trying to draw in an audience that perhaps they don't have right now, which you alluded to, Shane. I mean, high school girls, they want to get that that audience in there too, but I think that they're going about it the wrong way. They're, they're doing it in a way where they crap on their core group of fans, which is us, let's face it, males, right? Right. Mostly males are going to go out and see these films, but they could still do it in a clever way. They just don't. That's kind of what we're dealing with right now. What do you think is the single biggest reason the MCU box office has declined since Endgame? I would say it's going to be interference on uneducated people. These movies, when they first started coming out, when Iron Man came out in 2008, even right before that, when we had Edward Norton's Incredible Hulk, that was pre-MCU era. That was the like, that was the dawn of it, right? There wasn't so much about fan service. It was about, we're going to write exactly what the fans want. Yes, not all of them were great, but as a whole, as the MCU, even up to Endgame, there was this integrity with the storyline, if you will. The majority percentage was pointed at source material. What's happened, we want this inclusion of people who don't necessarily watch these films to find value and want to come watch them, well, that's not fair. You're trying to include people into a movie that don't care about comic book movies, but yet we do. And so you're completely destroying the source material. You're rewriting character uh, identities. You're rewriting character ethnicities. You're rewriting characters completely. You're rewriting so much. Why would you rewrite things when the source material is here? The material that you're actually supposed to be pulling your story from you're throwing out the window like, we don't need that. We can do a better job than the actual source. I believe that's where we've seen that that slow progression. These writers or whoever they're bringing on, they're stepping away. In the beginning of MCU, you had the, the council of people who really kind of made sure, hey, this kind of steers off the path. Let's kind of move it back. Let's Let's adjust. I think because of where they're positioned, Kevin Feige and others like that have been influenced by the organizations versus the material that he was passionate about in the first place. Yeah, I pretty much agree with you. I think that it's diversity and inclusion over story, over storytelling. It's almost more insulting, especially if you're a person of a color, to get a character that was always originally white. Like, why can't you guys create an original character for me, someone that represents me and what I'm about, versus giving me some ripoff of Captain America or giving me some amputee that nobody cares about <laughs> in the Hawkeye show. I was throwing a jab at Echo there, but at least Echo was an original character that was created Correct. in the comics. They just haven't done a good job of bringing her over into the MCU. Nobody really cares about the character. The same thing. I was talking to you about this yesterday, Daisy. Nobody cares about Monica Rambeau. Why? Because they haven't given us a reason to care about that character. They can right. do better. And it really shows to me that all they really care about, well, obviously they're a huge corporation, is money. And, sh and saying that they care about uh, diversity inclusion when they really actually don't. And you can see that with these characters that they're bringing over. We could sense that we were getting something special with characters like Captain America and Iron Man. But when we got Monica Rambeau, it was like, okay, why do we care about this character? They haven't given us enough reason to care about the character yet. So yeah, I think that that's, a little bit of, of what you were saying there, but that's the biggest reason. I mean, in my opinion, it's just 
they don't care about their core fans enough and they're putting the message above everything else. Of course, the storytelling and the CGI and everything else has gone downhill. There's been a lot of trickle effects from everything. But at the end of the day, I think that's probably the biggest reason. What do you think, Shane? In the same realm, but have you guys heard about the recent, I'm sure it's going to be an all right movie, but just the changes that they made in the new Snow White and the Seven Dwarves movies that's coming out? Yes. Snow White is uh, like an Indian girl or something like that. She's I don't Hispanic. mean Hispanic. Hispanic. Okay, yeah. Ah, weird. Weird. No real big deal necessarily. I don't care about Snow White. I didn't, I, you know, I don't mean that in any type of way, but it's kind of like the same thing with Ariel and stuff like that. They change things. Sometimes I feel like I just seems like what is the reasoning for doing that? Why did I think it to me it almost like kind of to your point makes people seem lazy? It's like, why don't y'all create like new stories and new characters to make people just as awesome? Because all you're doing is alienating like so many people who have these feet. Like, I'm sure some people are like, I love Snow White either way, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna watch it and see appreciate the story. It's not about Snow White, it's the same thing about I'm just referring to this. It's interesting how there's so many different uh factors in like society, I, not society specifically, but entertainment. This is starting to happen and this has been happening. And it's like, is it just because like the writers are just so lazy that they're like the easy way out is to just go with the inclusion part and just be like, hey, we're giving somebody else of a you know different background or you know different ethnicity an opportunity to do this. It's like that's great that they're given an opportunity. Why wouldn't you like build them up a role like the same? way that you would have built up these other people you guys are the best people who have ever written anything in the world historically and just using the disney umbrella again why can't y'all create more stuff like to, to give to like broader audiences and then bring them together 10 years down the road for some reason or another you know what i'm saying like i understand that it's like trying to balance the scales of you know the world and stuff like that but i personally think that that would be the reason why it is starting to come down. Plus you have people like me who get online and start talking trash about stuff and it affects people, not necessarily me, but I'm just saying like it, it affects people's perception. A lot of people are, have a dirty taste in their mouth because of Disney for various reasons that we don't have to talk about here. But I think that that also has left a stain on Marvel, not to mention that they practice some of the same things and they are owned by the same people. Also, it could have something to do with the fact that five years ago, box office, people made more money, it seems like, because more people had money to go to the movies. If it kind of seems like there's also, to add to that, to shoot them some bail, I don't think we're hitting any of those records like we were back then, but also uh, movie tickets cost more money, so we still might be. I don't know. The first superhero movie you guys ever watched, it doesn't have to be exactly the first one, but just give us a basic idea of you know, your first experience with superhero films. Oh, man, mine's going to be because of Dad. But the very first Superman, Chris Reeves, that was nostalgic, man. Even to this day, I could watch that movie and have great enjoyment because that was like my first introduction to superhero films. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? There's two movies that come to mind. I was a Batman kid. I was big into Batman. So they had the animated Batman and uh, Mr. Freeze, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't remember. There was a movie, you know. I know they had the shows and stuff like that, but it was a movie, and I remember seeing like a commercial for it on like Free Willy or Space Jam or something like that. I remember that movie, and around the same time, I got super into the Batman and like uh, Mr. Freeze, Batman and Robin. So it was still Mr. Freeze. That movie with George Clooney is Batman. When we did okay. the bat when we did the Batman episode, I did joke around about George Clooney being like my favorite Batman or whatever. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, absolutely. Facts. Only. Bat nipples and all. Yes, bat nipples and all. And I loved that movie. The movie was pretty tight, you know, especially when I got older and started to care more about certain actors. I'm like, man, I can't believe that's Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but so uh happy to see him pop up at the end of the flash. Yeah. Yes. Oh well, man, that was the best part of the movie to me. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think I, I don't think I had as much expectations or as much angst in general against the people who develop movies overall, but I enjoyed that movie more than I thought that I would have. The Flash okay. movie, that is, by the way. And I was also going to say, just as honorable mention, last time I was on here, we talked about Ninja Turtles. If Ninja Turtles are considered a superhero movie, that second Ninja Turtles movie was on VHS at my house. It was lit. And I used to watch it all the time. And it was one of the first superhero movies, without a doubt, that I ever fell in love with. Yeah, we're all the same age, so I feel I thought that our answers would all be the same, which yeah. they they're gonna be. Yeah, same thing here. <laughs> Batman '89, TMT one and two, and then also the older Christopher Reeves films. I started watching Superman four before I started watching any of the other Superman films. So lucky for me, I'm a big fan of Superman four, 
Mark Pillow's Nuclear Man. And speaking of Mark Pillow's Nuclear Man, let's transition over to this. Could Nuclear Man be brought back in the modern DCU? Like, th- seriously, give this a little bit of thought before you respond. A character that has a blonde mullet, a spandex suit with black and gold, and fingernails that retract. And not to mention this character was created in the sun using Superman's hair strapped to a nuclear missile. Okay. (laughs) Could this character be taken and fiddled with, uh, to use a word that my parents use, fiddled with a bit, polished off and rebranded and put into the modern DCU? I'm not going to say it's not possible because currently they will throw anything out there and see if it sticks. So I'm not going to say it's beyond them and beyond their integrity, Uh, (laughs) but I would say, how dare you, (laughs) Daisy? But I will say I could see something like that happening if they wanted to, if it was in James Gunn's mind to include that character somewhere, I think he would. I think if anyone could create a potential better presentation page to screen, I think James Gunn could do a good job. I definitely think he would change some things around about maybe origin or how he came to be, or even leave out certain powers, probably going to leave out the claws uh, or change something around, but I definitely could see the inclusion somewhere. You brought up James Gunn and that just made me a lot more excited about this whole entire question, because if anybody could do nuclear man in the modern era, it would be James Gunn. He made polka dot man popular. Well, not popular, but he made polka dot man. Cool. Okay. He, he, made, it, he made it memorable. Yes, yes, absolutely. If anybody could do it, a char- wacky character like this, I think James Gunn could do it and maybe even with the claws. What do you think, Shane? I'm very unfamiliar with him outside of hearing you talk about him several times. Uh, I think you might have said you reached out to him uh, to come on the show. Is that the same guy? Yeah, I interviewed him like a month ago. Okay, that's right. Okay, yeah. Uh, and that's awesome. That's so random, but it's awesome. Uh, so happy to announce that to the world. Yeah. Just pat myself on the back. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know much about his character, so I'd be cu- I would be need to, I guess, do some research on his character. But he looks like a wild boy. Uh, just judging, looking at all these photos of him, I pulled him up earlier. Take a look at him, Shane. Yeah, I see him. I got something I... <laughs> Uh, why not? I think James Gunn would be the one, but we are going to need a new Superman, though, right? For that, we already got him. Oh, who's playing Superman? David Cornswell. That's a crazy name. Good for David, though. He's the new Superman. I hope he does well. I think he will. He looks good. He, of course, he's not going to be as good to me as Cavill, but that doesn't mean I'm going to hate the movie. I think that you know, once again, James Gunn is doing this, and it's exciting. I think he's going to do a great job. I'd like to see Nuclear Man in a video game. Oh yeah, that would be super fun. Yeah, definitely. I don't know why he was not in any of the injustices. They should have wrote him into that uh, storyline. Oh, yeah, that would have been great. He would have been a great DLC character, especially <laughs> yes. for the sequel. He, you know, he scratched Superman's neck and he incapacitated him for months. Oh, just by doing that. Nuclear. Imagine what, what he could have done, Shane, if he would have taken one of those fingernails and, and shoved it straight <laughs> up. <laughs> that might be fun. Is Scott Stapp overrated or underrated? We'll start with you, Mr. Uh, Shane O'Mac. Oh man, Scott. Scott is a hundred percent underrated. Uh, I don't really know how somebody could resurge so many times and just like I think he's he's finally there, dude. The volcano is about to blow with Creed getting back together, making some public appearances. Scott, like I went down a rabbit hole of his Instagram reels or whatever the other day, and I'm telling you, I was on there for probably about like an hour and a half, just going through his re- you know forty five second reels. Hi hey, guys, Scott here. <laughs> Like just, I'm just, I'm talking about like the most like Gavin's dad type dude ever. Like just the way that this, oh, sorry. The way that this man carries himself is just like, you would just want to go to a coffee shop and listen to him talk like with your mom or something like that, which, you know, Scott's probably there, you know, telling he's trying to, he's like facing down the barrel of so much redemption right now, but his redemption arc is great. Like I'm loving it, watching it online and stuff like that. And just seeing him pop up on my explore page of like old videos of Creed. I'm always tagging you and stuff, John, but, uh, you need to tag me in more. Yeah. There's there's never too much Creed. Yeah. He is, uh, I also think of uh, Creed as synonymous. Scott Staff is synonymous with you. Uh, I just want you to know that because you you were in a band that covered Creed, like the second the second concert I ever went to of that ilk of music. Your band played, and uh, it was under Jason Galt's porch, 
and y'all covered Creed, and I'm pretty sure. And if y'all didn't, then it sure as hell sounded like it. <laughs> <laughs> underrated yeah, though man, i don't think we ever covered creed actually when i think about that yeah i, mean, I don't you know have, you may have but uh we did cover an alter bridge song there for a while but that was way before that we started covering that yeah i don't know what you're thinking about shane maybe dude, you just listen dude, maybe our crap might, just sounded too much like creed dude this, i was about to say this literally i was 13 i'm 31 now so yeah that was a long time ago i've never talked about scott Stapp on this show but i thought this this what you think about that show yeah. would be the perfect opportunity to do so actually i'll take that back i have talked about him once or twice on here growing up scott stat was a idol of mine you know the the band creed was on fire in the late 90s early 2000s took over the world i mean at that time they were a very record-breaking band i mean they still hold some records in the music making world but what do you think daisy you think scott Stapp is overrated or underrated i'm right with you guys i think he's underrated Human Clay was my very first CD that I ever personally bought myself. And, Great one. Uh, and dude, I'm just going to tell you, if that CD stopped working, it was because I played it so much. Shake the walls with, with arms wide open all the time, just acting like I had my own button up blowing in the wind. And <laughs> like time after time, you know, all the stuff that him and the band went through, alcohol and all of that. But even just the redemption behind that, man. Like every time he's resurged as a solo artist, any time that they have ever come back for anything, you see this like uprising of fans that come back and support. I don't know many people that I have followed in music and we we all have music backgrounds and I don't really care how many concerts he screwed up. <laughs> like I, the music was great. I'm going to be looking for, it's crazy that you brought this up because me and a guy here at the church were talking about it this morning when they posted on TikTok where uh, Scott Stapp walks into the rehearsal room and they're all sitting there. He starts quoting a line just from a song asking, where should we begin? <laughs> I got super excited because I was like, man, hopefully they'll come within like 100 miles of here because I will make the drive. Dude, same. Listen, I have said this and I like... They, they have lived long enough to go from being the biggest thing in the world to falling apart to being like a bit of a joke, like an underlying joke, to being like if the volcano hits at the right time, Creed is going to take over the planet for like four to six months and they're going to go on tour and people are going to be like, yo, people are living in nostalgia with Creed out there rocking. That would be awesome. Then they could go off into the sunset, dude. I'm talking about like, it's like Stone Cold Steve Austin and getting all the belts and then just quitting again. I don't know. Like, if that's something like that happened. Yeah, they had those two. I don't know if they're doing the tour yet. I don't know. Maybe they did announce that and I missed it, but I don't, they, I don't know that they have. I they're just, doing the two cruises and those two cruises sold out in like less than a day, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, they sold out really fast. So yeah, it's exciting times to be a, a Creed fan and a Scott Stapp fan. The footage, even yeah. if I don't get to see them, it's still going to be amazing to see them again. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a wet dream for me. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. It's been fun. It's been great. Check us out on the other socials. Check Daisy out. Check Shane out. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>